that was the sweetest introduction that I think I've ever, I've ever been given. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, I'm, I'm also talking about something that I haven't spoken about before um, today. This, this was uh, triggered by, uh, by a blog post that, uh, that I made for the TED conference uh, just a few weeks ago. They, uh, they asked me to, um, and a few other people, to write about uh, some things that would blow our minds over the next 30 years. It's, it's Ted's 30th anniversary, and I, I guess this is on the brain. And, um, and I, I, took, I tried to take the assignment seriously and, and really think hard about, about what would really surprise most people uh, over the next 30 years that, that I might have some insights into. Um, I, I didn't include things like climate change because we all know that, that we're really headed for, for a real choke point or a crisis with respect to that. Uh, but I tried to list some things that, that, um, that I think are interesting and maybe a little bit less studied, less understood. And um, when I started to talk to Herb about what I might go into here at the, at the, at the conference, uh, it was kind of a, uh, well, eventually we, we decided that it needed to be two talks. So I guess it'll be one today and one tomorrow. And I'll, I'll talk now um, only about machine intelligence. I'm going to leave uh, gender selection and economics for, for tomorrow. And, uh, and I'm going to skip... Uh, the body, space, and sexuality, I'm sorry. Uh, but we can talk about it uh, maybe, maybe at dinner or something. <laughs> so uh, he also said that since, I'm, since I have this extra time, I should say something about, about myself and, and my, my history, so I'll, I'll try and do that quickly. Uh, I unearthed this, uh, this notebook from my childhood uh, also just a few months ago, and uh, that says a little bit about, about what I was like when I was growing up. Um, I was always very into inventing things. Uh, so this was a, a reciprocating, actually sort of a, a perpetual motion machine, which I went through a whole phase of about a year and a half of perpetual motion machines. Uh, and uh, that's, um, that's 1985. Um, and it was, it, was, it was kind of cute and heartbreaking to read through some of these inventions. <laughs> but I was very, very attracted to, uh, of course, when you start inventing and thinking about this kind of stuff in that period, uh, electronics began to attract me a lot, and I began to play a lot and tinker a lot with electronics. And electronics led invariably to digital things, to digital circuits, and, uh, and that led uh, invariably to computers, which were just taking off then. This is a point before uh, most people understood in the mainstream what computers were going to be good for or what they were going to do. But I was very interested in, in, um, in programming them at this point. And, um, and spent a lot of my childhood doing this kind of stuff while thinking that I was going to become a theoretical physicist when I grew up because that was much more fundamental and much more interesting than this monkeying around with computers stuff. So um, I went to university, I studied physics and applied math, um, but the, the obsession with computery things never really went away. And at some point I realized that I'd better, I'd better focus where my passion really was on inventing and on making. And, um, uh, so, for, for a while, I was uh, working on computational neuroscience sorts of problems, because it's also one of those very, very interesting thresholds of, of human understanding and of technology, and, um, and met, met my wife doing computational neuroscience. She's the, she's the serious one, uh, the serious computational neuroscientist. Uh, I've done some other work on, on things like um, computational history, so using computational techniques to understand uh, some things about the earliest printing. This is really sort of Applying, uh, applying math and mathematical techniques to, to figuring out um, things that, uh, that they're not normally applied to, using it as sort of a telescope to look at other things. Uh, I, I've been involved in a couple of startups. I made my, my own in 2004, and uh, that got bought by Microsoft in 2006, which is how I ended up uh, in the whole big company game. And, uh, and I've just moved to, to Google now about uh, three or four months ago. So, very recent change, and uh, so I'm not going to be talking about any of the things that I did at Microsoft today. Um, the reason that I went to Google, in large part, was because Larry Page convinced me that uh, that, that company is very, very serious about going after machine intelligence. And this is sort of the, the grand challenge and the grand ambition uh, I think, of, of our time. And it's, it's two-sided. On the one hand, it's understanding how brains work. That's the neuroscience side. 
And on the other side, it's about building systems that, that have the sort of intelligence that our brains have. And those, those two activities, one of them science, one technology, have the same relationship to each other that understanding bird flight and uh, designing the first gliders that, in the 19th century, that relationship between uh, avionics and, and, uh, or aviation and, and, uh, and science has been, uh, you know, it's, been, it's almost a cliche now that, that, that AI is like, like airplanes. Same principles apply to bird flight and to planes, but of course you don't necessarily ape all of the details, so they don't flap their wings. But they still are both using these Navier-Stokes equations, Bernoulli's law, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think Google is very, very serious about this, and I was very attracted to go and work with them on, on that problem. And uh, that kind of brings back some of, some of my computational neuroscience history, and that's been really fun. Um, so uh, this is uh, the history of, of, of machine intelligence in four lines. Uh, the, the beginning of it, really, in, in the 1950s, was, uh, was about the earliest uh, discoveries about neurons uh, and how they work and how they compute in brains, and the earliest hypotheses about how that might happen, and a great deal of progress was made in this early period. Uh, and um, really, the place where things got stuck is um, the, com the computational power to do non-trivial things with artificial neurons just wasn't there at this point. So there were, uh, you know, there was a very famous story of a group of scientists who got together for a summer thinking they would solve intelligence over the summer. And, and they did come out with some, some very impressive stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't the solution. Uh, and then there was a, a dark period. And, and then there was another um, bright period, I guess, during the 80s. And uh, that was the period of expert systems and the, the serious beginnings of natural language processing and, and so on. But what characterized the 80s really was a lack of attention to, um, to things that were biologically plausible. And we, we really only have one example of working intelligence today, which is this one. And, and so the 80s, I think, were a lot of surface explorations of, of how uh, language and other hallmarks of intelligence could be modeled using very abstract systems, made a certain amount of progress, but brittle. And then there was another AI winter. And, uh, and then something very special began happening around 2006, which, which I'll talk about now. And I think that a lot of it was, was really driven by, um, by the, the extreme rise in computational power uh, around, around that time. Uh, in fact, partly thanks to GPUs, to, to graphics processors, becoming useful as general purpose computing machines. All right, so the 1980s and that period during the AI winter, that's when this information retrieval kind of stuff and natural language processing happened. The whole era of search came out of that, I think, out of that way of thinking. And, um, and, that's, and, and, and in a way, even, even Watson, which I, I think is the, the best example of information retrieval system, is in that tradition. It's about memorizing a lot of facts using, uh, using a, a kind of rigid machine store and then applying mechanical principles of language processing to try and retrieve uh, facts and knowledge from, uh, from that database. And it's a very impressive achievement. But it's very, very different from the way real brains work. In the same way that Deep Blue which you know, can, can kick the ass of a, of a professional chess player, is not doing the same thing that, that a real brain is doing. It's evaluating the tree of possible chess games exhaustively and uh, doing things uh, at, at a scale that the brain can't, but it's not doing the same thing that the brain is doing. It's doing a sort of brute force calculation, a brute force evaluation of games. When we look at a chessboard and we play, we play with intuition and we play by understanding the, the game and by, and by understanding the the gestalt of the moves, and that's not something that, that computers were able to do uh, back in the deep blue days at all. So, brains. Um, computational power of a brain, uh, I, I've, when I think about what the computational power is, I imagine two bounds, an upper bound and a lower bound, on how much computing might be happening in, in a brain. The, the lower bound, I think, is given by uh, the roboticist Hans Moravec, and he did a really simple-minded calculation uh, back in the 90s, and the calculation was as follows. We, we pretty much know what the retina is doing, and that's like a little outpost of brain. It's this detector of bars and, and, and simple edges. And, um, and so he said, well, I know about how many MIPS, how many million instructions per second it would take to do the same thing on a computer, so just by functionally extrapolating, we say, well, the brain is about 75,000 times heavier than the retina, so let's multiply that by 75,000. And you get a number out, and the number, is, um, is about 100 
teraflops, or 100 trillion operations per second, is what, what he thinks a brain is capable of doing. And this is an old uh, plot of Moravec sort of showing that. Uh, on the other side is Henry Markram, who, uh, who led the, uh, I guess is leading, the, um, the, blue, the Blue Brain Project, I suppose it's called. So it's here in Europe, and it's an effort to really simulate the entire brain in a very slavish way, down to the details of all of the synapses and all of the molecules and the gene expression and so on. And so that's a very, very literal minded, you know, how much computing power would it take to simulate a brain? And his estimate uh, of, of that is that that'll take an exaflop, which is uh, 10,000 times more than, than Moravec's estimate. The thing is that these bounds, these upper and lower bounds, they differ by a factor of 10,000, but given how Moore's law is going, that means they differ by 12 years. So we're very rapidly approaching this, this scale. Um, this is a, a petaflop computer, which is my, my guess at what the real power is that it'll take. And that, that was available in supercomputers in 2009, and it'll be available on a desktop before the end of, of this decade. So we, we have now the computational power to do this. And I'm definitely not of the school of thought that you, know, you, you, put, you put existing systems into a computer powerful enough like this and it wakes up like Frankenstein's monster. It doesn't happen. But what is definitely the case is that when you have graduate students able to work with computers of the right power on the desktop, in the lab, and play, it seems as if they very quickly figure out the tricks that are needed in order to bring the whole project up to the next level. And that's the remarkable thing that has really started happening, especially since 2006. I think really the, the father of that whole movement was, was Jeff Hinton, who I'm very privileged to work with now. The, the first project that he and his lab did using these deep neural networks, which are much more, um, much more um, closely resemble the way visual cortex works than anything that had been done previously. So with a very toy data set, so this is a data set of digits, 26 by 26 pixels, grayscale of um, handwritten digits. Nothing interesting. And the, the challenge is to look at this image and recognize uh, what digit it is. It's a simple task. Uh, the post office was very interested in these kinds of things, which is why the National Institute of Technology and Standards you know, set up government-funded programs to, uh, to, to solve these problems. And um, so the data sets look like this. You know, thousands of people writing digits, uh, handwritten digits. And that's the training data and the test data. Hinton and his students set up a system that looks like cortex. It looks uh, like, like neurons that activate one another in layers. And they didn't put in any assumptions whatsoever about the shape of the problem. They, uh, they just had it learn from, uh, directly from the data. And Yes, it performed better than anything else had ever performed at this problem. But what I think is much more interesting is that when you look at what the neurons are actually computing in the early layers of that system, those functions that they're computing, those, um, those shapes that they're looking for in the inputs, look just like what we see when we measure what shapes are being computed in the first layers of visual cortex in, in monkeys and in people. So you see behaviors emerging in the system that look like the same things that, are, that, that, uh, that emerge in real biological brains. Uh, that's not because the system slavishly imitated all the details, the gene expression, and so on of what brains do, but because it really seems like we're onto something fundamental about how perception works. And even more interestingly, when you then extend those same style of systems to do much more abstract and much more general tasks, like recognizing what's this picture of, what's in this scene, then you end up with higher and higher level neurons that represent chunks and pieces of semantic stuff in images. And these look a lot like what you observe in real brains when you start to record from neurons higher in visual cortex, from V4 and from infratemporal cortex. And um, you know, so this is, a, this is the Jetpack Spotter app that runs in real time on an iPhone nowadays. And uh, you know, I just pointed it this morning at the at the bottle of Planck in the Malmaison, and it says it's, it's wine bottle and it's probably red wine. And that task of being able to, dis to discriminate in real time what, what the, the thing is looking at, this is not a, a class of problem that was even remotely a, a tra sort of tractable just three years ago. Uh, so this is very, very new. It, and it, it doesn't mean that we've got everything figured out about primary visual cortex, but it does mean that at least the feed-forward connections in visual cortex that, that do that sort of bottom-up 
trickle of understanding, of, of, uh, of recognition, we really seem to be onto this. We really seem to understand what's going on here. And this keeps getting better and better and better and better every year, tracking just behind Moore's law. Um, in fact, I, I, I just ran across a paper recently that directly compares neural representations between these deep neural nets and uh, macaques with electrodes in their brains. And um, the, the best new networks are around the same level as, as, uh, as macaque brains now in visual cortex. Here's, um, here's another, another interesting data point. This is, um, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have a proper movie to show this, but this, this is um, a screen from the Atari 2600. Some of you might know that Google acquired a company called DeepMind here in the UK um, a few months ago, and that's, that's actually one of the reasons that, that, I'm, that I'm visiting now, uh, to, to go and spend a little bit of time with them. Their claim to fame is that um, they have built systems using reinforcement learning and other neurally inspired techniques that play Atari games. And you know, the Atari 2600 is a system that, you know, it's a very, very simple video game system, self-contained worlds. You can set them up in a simulator and, um, and run them. And what, what these computers are doing is they're, they're looking at the pixels on the screen and they're wired up to the score. So they know what the score is and they can move the controller around and the only direction that they're given is maximize the score. And um, in the process of doing that, they learn to play uh, the video games in the 2600. Uh, they can learn to play pretty much any game in the, in the Atari 2600 repertoire in, um, in a couple of days of gameplay. And in many games, they become much better than human experts at playing those games. And that represents a, a novel, self-contained universe and it's the same algorithm that's learning all of those different games. It's not as if it's tuned in any way or has any prior knowledge about one particular game or another. So this, again, is a really a watershed, a very, very interesting moment. And when I look at those things and I see how fast the research is progressing and how fast the underlying computational substrates are progressing, I feel like, you know, we really are on the cusp. Uh, this, this, I don't think that this is another hype cycle and we're going, we're going to kind of fall back down into a third AI winter again. I think we're really going to crack it this time. And it's hard to understate the, hard to overstate? <laughs> it's hard to overstate how, how important a change that's going to be in, in the whole human story. And we have been alone as, uh, as intelligent beings on Earth. Um, I mean, we can talk about dolphins, we can talk about elephants and crows and parrots and so on, but you know, in a way, those exceptions only make more clear how unique our, our position is. And we're now on the cusp of creating things that have that, that have that magical property. What does that mean? I mean everything around us is created. You know, all of this man-made stuff, all of the ways in which we've modified the earth and we've invented things and so on, all made by our intelligence. What happens when we also are making intelligence? Now, last point that I want, that I want to make in my couple of minutes here today uh, is that, you know, there, there are a lot of, um, the Skynet idea has been, has been around now for, for many years, and it has, you know, before Terminator, there were, there were other more articulate expressions of those kinds of fears and concerns, that we are making the intelligence and the technology that's going to make us obsolete, that's going to surpass us, and we're going to go the way of the other great apes, that we have done that too on Earth. And um, I think that there are a lot of concerns that are very legitimate in thinking about what we do with, with machine intelligence. But we should also keep in mind that inventing intelligent systems, inventing machine intelligence, is not the same thing as reinventing life. And these things, when we make them, will not be alive any more than computers today are alive. What I mean by that is that life is all about Darwinian evolution. And, uh, you know, intelligence is a very, very recent layer on top of a very ancient system that goes back to the single-celled bacteria and, and maybe further back. And all of the things that we fear about what we are relate to the red of tooth and claw characteristics that, that come about through, um, through Darwinian evolution the quests for more resources, the desire to 
mate to control, to dominate, to own, uh, even the fear of death uh, or the desire to stay alive at all costs. Those are all things that have been selected for in us, and they were selected for in us long before we had intelligence. You can look at any animal you like and see those kinds of patterns. You can see dominance hierarchies in insects. And so my assumption, unless we do something very stupid, is that we're not going to evolve these intelligences. Uh, we're not going to shake them up in a jar and keep on iterating them until uh, one of them comes out victorious, having defeated all of the other ones, and say, now, you know, now, we've, uh, now we've made intelligence. Then we will have made both intelligence and wired it up to a fitness function that may very well not be good for us when it comes out of the jar. But there's really no need for us to do that whatsoever. I mean, when you look even across humans, you find ones who are selfish and who are assholes and who uh, don't desire good for others, and you find ones who are very selfless and very altruistic and, and who are afraid of death and who are relatively unafraid of death and so on and so forth. And we have the choice as we build these things to wire them up to whatever fitness function we like. They're not evolved. They're not reproducing. We're making them. And, uh, and so we can make what, is, what they consider to be good or what they go for, what they're rewarded with, whatever we like. And that's a great power, I think, both for good and for ill, like every kind of technology that we've made has been. And um, finally, just because whatever we make is not necessarily wired up to the same limbic system and the same kind of emotional system and so on that we have in our brains may or may not mean that they qualify as persons when we make them. I don't, I don't really know what the answer to this question is. And I don't, I'm not sure that it has an answer. Uh, I think that you know, what we have empathy for, what we consider to be a being as opposed to just a machine, is frankly largely a question of, of aesthetics or of taste or of an agreement that we make with each other. Uh, you know, we, we, are, we are machines, but we're also something more. And I don't know when, when the things that we make become that something more. And uh, I don't think that at some fundamental level that's an answerable question. And we're going to be grappling with that one in, in 20 years' time, I think. So uh, I'll end there for today, and we'll talk about some of the other things tomorrow. Thank you.